Today, Dr. Chu and I will be discussing podcasting in medical education, fleeting fad or durable innovation. The QR code displayed before uh, will allow you to submit, uh, displayed right now will allow you to submit questions. Um, we sh you could also submit questions uh, via uh, Twitter as well, uh, which we will have uh, the hashtag on every slide. We do have a couple of disclosures to make. As Dr. Gordish pointed out, both of us are uh, heavily invested in the podcast space. Um, myself, uh, co-founded Core AM, Dr. Chu being an active uh, producer in C Curbsiders, and he's founded Curbsiders. So uh, our agenda today is as follows. First, Chris is going to talk about uh, some basic uh, basics of podcast and kind of bring us up to a shared mental model of exactly what we're talking about, and we're going to use that for the rest of the talk. Then we're going to re review how medical podcasting has evolved over the last decade or two. Um, indeed, these are no longer radio shows on demand, and we're going to hope to prove to you the innovation that is happening uh, in this space. But we're not going to give you all rainbows and unicorns. There are major concerns about the widespread adoption of podcasts within traditional medical education, and so we're going to lay out some barriers, and of course, we're going to provide, uh, you, present you with some opportunities that those barriers present. And finally, we're going to hope uh, we want to inspire you to check us out. I mean, obviously, we want you to subscribe, rate, and review. But even more than that, we hope to change the way you think not only about podcasting, but about podcasts and medical education, and also your role as digital educators. We'll finish with a question and answer. And finally, with that, I will turn it over to the Chu man himself. So no conversation about podcasting or medical podcasting can really start without talking about foam first. So what is FOAM? FOAM stands for Free Open Access Medical Education, sometimes called Meducation. It was this first coined in 2012 by, uh, in Dublin by Michael Cadigan um, over a pint of Guinness. And what is FOAM? So FOAM is a collection of resources, it's a community, and it's an ethos. It's really agnostic of any platform, so FOAM encompasses both Twitter, YouTube, podcasting, blogs, um, all those types of platforms. Um, FOAM is not really a teaching philosophy or strategy, but really it's a crowdsource educational project which support and augment traditional learning. So that's what FOAM is. When you're on Twitter or something of the like, hashtag FOAMED is really the conversation. So within the structure of FOAM, we have medical podcasts. So what are podcasts, you may ask? Some may not know what they are. So, Wikipedia says, podcasts are an episodic series of spoken word digital audio files that the user can download to a personal device for easy listening. So it's basically an audio file that you can listen to on your phone. And so if you, you go to Apple Podcasts, you're gonna see tons of people of just lots of conversations where there, people are talking about different themes and so forth, but I, think, I say that medical podcasts are different. Medical podcasts are high-powered educational tools. Many of them are scripted, some podcasts have highly interactive cases. They have detailed show notes. Many have citations and references, and a lot provide CME. So when some people say podcasts, they may think Joe Rogan. For me, I think nephrologist Joe Toff. Um, this medical podcasts aren't your grandfather's typical podcast. So when we're talking about who listens to podcasts, podcast listenership, we know that this has been studied, especially within emergency medicine literature. There, there are several studies that look at this. Um, one study showed with over 350 resident respondents that the majority of them use podcasts at least once a month in terms of supplementing their regular education. Another study of over 250 medical uh, emergency medicine residents showed that many of them preferred medical podcasts over traditional platforms like textbooks or journals. So what do we know in our own um, in our own experiences. So the Curbsiders have a, a weekly newsletter that we send out every week. Um, it has um, references, it has our show notes, it has notifications of new episodes as well as infographics. When people sign up for our newsletter, they also do a survey. So what do we know from our survey? Um, from, from last time we looked at the survey, we had ten, over 10,000 respondents. And yes, majority of our medical podcast listeners are physicians. You have attending physicians, and for a smaller extent, you have residents and fellows. But it's not just physicians. We have everyone from um, APPs, so NPs and PAs. We have students, and we have, even have a smaller subset of pharmacists and nurses 
Marty tells me that for Coriam, they even have pre-hospital uh, folks like EMTs who listen to their podcasts as well. So going from who listens to podcasts, why do they listen to podcasts? So the first I want to talk about is edutainment. So every week people tune into their favorite TV shows to see their favorite characters and hear them, and they really enjoy that. And I, I would say that from when you're looking at podcasts, podcast listeners do the same thing. And they, they tune in, they listen to their favorite hosts, their recurrent guests, and they really enjoy it. They get to know these personalities and they become familiar to them. So when I listen to the Curbsiders, I slowly get used to the horrible puns that Stuart Brigham or Hannah Abrams may be giving. Or when I listen to Core I Am, I have to deal with his dad jokes all the time. So, you know, I enjoy listening to podcasts. But podcasts isn't just all fun. Many people listen to podcasts to stay up to date. And for many people, this is their preferred modality of staying up to date. Um, you know, if I want to listen and hear about diabetes or heart failure, I can tune into a podcast. If I want to hear what an expert says about the newest hypertension guidelines, I can find a podcast for that. So podcasts really allow learners to learn asynchronously as compared to lectures like what we're doing now where we have a set time and place where you're supposed to be doing your learning. Learners can really customize and curate their own learning plan with podcasts. Lastly, I want to talk about community. So podcasts give another form for our listeners to find connection with fellow residents, attendings, colleagues, and in even the larger medical community. It really helps them develop and increases their sense of professional identity. So we know pe why people are listening to podcasts. Let's go to where. And when we talk about where, we can look at where in several different aspects. So first of the where is probably the most important and attractive thing about podcasts is you can listen to podcasts wherever you want. And we find that most listeners listen to podcasts while they're doing completely mundane things, whether they're cooking, exercising, commuting. But is this flexibility that is really attractive to podcasts? You know, listeners really identify podcasts as one of the most efficient, enjoyable ways to stay up to date. Another aspect of thinking about where is looking at the experts that you see on these podcasts. So experts may be traditionally geographically or locationally separate from people, and therefore you may not be, hear, be able to hear their voice. Podcasts give that second level, another platform for us to hear their voices. Their voices go directly to our headphones. So we actually see this in COVID right now, especially if, whether it's grand rounds or even smaller new conferences or other lectures, we're definitely seeing people come from other institutions giving these smaller talks without having to worry about airfares or hotel fees. So this is sort of a similar thing that you see in podcasts. Lastly, when we talk about where, we're talking about learning environment. The learning environment so provided by podcasts is a low stress atmosphere. It can be really less intimidating for learners and really show like a low stakes dialogue that really engenders positive learning. Next, I'm gonna talk about when. When are these people, when are these listeners taking care of, taking in podcasts? First, I want to talk about background knowledge. So background knowledge really refers to like general medical knowledge. It's, this is the foundation in which we build all our advanced concepts. Typically, we found background knowledge is gained through reading textbooks or going to lectures. Um, but now we find that podcasts fill many of these roles. Many podcasts focus directly on core topics. And like I said before, learners can then download them and curate them and do them and listen to them at their own pace. In contrast, from background knowledge to foreground knowledge, foreground knowledge is that sp very specific knowledge that really inform your clinical decisions and actions. Many people consider foreground knowledge that just-in-time knowledge, the just-in-time learning. You have that patient with hyponatremia, and you're like, I didn't quite get that during rounds today, so I'm going to find a podcast, and I'm going to listen to that tonight. Or that, the crazy acid-base thing that you just could never get when you are in medical school that's when you're going to find an acid base talk. So we've talked a little bit about the, the, the five W's. I always forget how many there are. The five W's of podcasting. Now we're going to talk about podcast innovations. So podcast innovations, we talk in several different ways. So we talk about podcast innovations in the sense that podcasts can innovate within themselves, either by their topics, 
their formatting, their distribution. But we can also talk about podcasts innovating in terms of medical education, and Marty's actually going to touch upon that. So in terms of looking at innovating within podcasts, we have a couple different categories. And these categories were first described by Dr. Shreya Trivedi, who is the co-founder of Core I Am with Marty, and Dr. Adam Rodman, who is with Bedside Rounds. So the first category, category or bucket that I would say is the modeling clinical reasoning and diagnosis. These are the podcasts that really help teach a skill that traditionally has been very difficult to teach. In fact, I think most people still don't know how to teach this skill. But often they take cases, morning report style, and a listener can walk through the important steps of clinical diagnosis and clinical reasoning. They can develop their own diagnostic schema and frameworks. They can use these to apply to their future clinical practice. I think one of the first podcasts I've, I've heard in this area was I Am Reasoning, which is a great podcast, but the new kid on the block called CP Solvers, or otherwise known as Clinical Problem Solvers, they were a fantastic podcast. They were founded by uh, Reza Manesh and Robbie Gaeta, who are protégés of the infamous Gupreet Dhaliwal, if you know who he is. Core I Am and Curbsiders also have a couple series also on clinical reasoning. The next group that I want to talk about is the multidisciplinary expert reviews. So on my podcast, The Cribsiders, which is a pediatric podcast, in the first couple of minutes, I, I have to I say this line. I say, we are the pediatric medicine podcast where we interview leading experts in the fields, of, in the fields to bring you clinical pearls, practice changing knowledge, and answer lingering questions about core topics in pediatric medicine. So these are the types of podcasts that we see that The Cribsiders and The Cribsiders and many of the Core IM episodes really excel in. But we also see Podcasts like from Robert Centaur and Amazon Call. Nationwide, Nationwide Children has um, Mike Patrick. He's got his PDCast CME. And even here at OSU, our, car Dr. Ca our cardiologist, Dr. Balaga, has the Must Know Facts podcast. The next group of podcasts I want to talk about is the Navigating Medical Ethics and History. Now, these are podcasts that really do that deep dive into what has made medicine and what our practice of medicine is today. So it shines a critical lens, often with a historical perspective, on the things we do. And sometimes, when we look at them closely, the things we do don't really make too much sense. So one of my favorite podcasts is from Adam Rahm, who I talked about earlier. He does Bedside Rounds. Corey M has done their fair share of episodes on that as well. Um, but actually, a new podcast, which I believe just dropped their 11th episode. It was The Curious Clinicians. This comes from OSU's own Dr. Abraham Cooper, along with some of our colleagues, Dr. Tony Brew and Dr. Hannah Abrams, where they take deep dives into curious op observations into the medical literature. The next group is the expert discussion of clinical research. This is what we normally term the, the journal club episodes. Um, they take the hosts, the guests, the experts, they really take apart and do a critical appraisal of the literature. They, they look at studies, they break it down to its biases and their innovations. One of the first podcasts I listened to that was this type was the Rounds, the Rounds Table podcast. But um, I also started the, the Hot Cakes episodes, which were on the Curbsiders, which do the same. Neff JC or Neff Journal Club has their own podcast series called, series called Freely Filtered, which I think is an amazing name. Um, here at OSU, EM Doc. Dr. Michael Pratt, he has the Ultrasound Gel podcast, which looks at recent literature in the, in the uh, areas of uh, point of care ultrasound. Lastly, the Key Lime podcast is another podcast where expert educators really look at literature and medical education. Lastly, the last book I want to talk about is probably my favorite. This is the bucket of narrative medicine. This is where our stories as physicians the stories of our life in medicine and those around us. Um, it helps us form our communities, inform our philosophies on humanism, mentorship, and self-identity. You know, a new podcast that came out is called The Silent Doc, where one of my colleagues, Dr. Chumo Benome, really tells fictional stories, short fictional stories in his own voice. If you like things other than, if you want to do some nonfiction, there's another podcast called The Nocturnist. Um, this is from Dr. Emily Silverman. And I believe we finally just said that she's going to be doing one of our grand rounds in January. So you guys will be able to listen to her as well. So the Nocturnus is what people have called the medical version of this storytelling platform, The Moth. So if you, think, if you know The Moth, then you sort of know what The Nocturnus is like, except they have a, a, a fantastic medical spin. 
Very recently, they had a, a podcast series called Stories from the Pandemic. And these are just a collection of stories that really, in recent times, have helped us as a community know that others around us have been scared and frustrated as we confront the COVID-19 pandemic. Another series they did is The Black Voices in Healthcare, which is executive produced by our colleague and friend, Dr. Kimberly Manning. And in this series, they're really able to add more perspective and enlighten us to those around us, especially what it means to be black and in medicine. So I've talked about a couple of the main buckets of innovations within podcasts. I'm gonna take it back to Marty over here. He's gonna to talk to you about how podcasts are innovating in medical education. So uh, what Dr. Chu presented was that the work that we are doing in medical podcasting fits within most, and I, I might argue all places within our traditional medical undergraduate and graduate education. There's con content available to complement the basic science courses, uh, into clerkships, and throughout the various practice of medicine courses that are braided within most of our modern uh, med school curricula. So the point is the opportunity is there to start using these podcasts formally in our curricula. But the question we should now address is how are the medical curricula currently innovating to include podcasting and other forms of phone? The first example I want to point out is an awesome homegrown example of an incredibly creative use of podcasting. This is a huge nod to our 2019 and 2020 OSU internal medicine residents, Dr. Tejas Sinha Ellen Liu and Dr. Devin uh, Haddad. Um, so this spring, as our in-person medical curricula came to a screeching COVID halt, the chiefs realized they needed to find ways to accommodate a graduate medical education curricula within virtual learning. And yes, Zoom was ruled out, rolled out uh, early and often, but adapting the very popular flipped classroom segment of our Tuesday school proved to be very difficult to recreate. So they harnessed a little bit of social media savvy. They adapted the flipped classroom session using podcasts as the launching pad to discuss topics. And so the flipped podcast series was born. Each of these sessions were pre-planned, announced a week ahead of time or so to the entire residency and the larger medical Twitter world. The content authors were invited to participate as moderators. This particular episode, um, they used a smoking cessation podcast and my colleague, Dr. Shrey Trevetti and I uh, were, were content moderators. And they went through and asked um, sequential audience poll questions or free answer questions based on the content the podcast covered. And for those who didn't listen to the podcast, participants could use the show notes that were available to answer the, uh, the questions that were, that were, provide, that were um, presented. So did, did the, uh, you know, Twitter, the, did the turnout on Twitter match the Tuesday school you know, session turnout? Almost certainly not. But this was May of 2020. This was the dawn of a global pandemic, and our chiefs here at Ohio State were trailblazers in blending of old strategies with new digital media. And like our pioneering chiefs here at Ohio State, there are other great examples of individual internal medicine residency programs formally and informally incorporating medical podcasting into their curricula. This is really, really cool. But what if I told you that there are some residencies that are incorporating podcasting and other forms of foam formally into their common program requirements. Buckle up, Ohio State. This is about to get wild. In 2008, as medical podcasting uh, started, started to uh, flourish and other asynchronous online learning modalities were beginning to show up around, but not necessarily within medical curricula, a work group from the Emergency Medicine Council of Residency Directors, or EM CORD, suggested formally, actively considering incorporation of these tools uh, into their educational program. Not long after that, in 2012, the Residency Review Committee for the Emergency Medicine ACGME Program uh, Committee, specifically within their program requirements, specified that 20% of the total, didact total didactic time could be sent spent in asynchronous learning. And with that, individualized interactive instruction, or I3, was born. I just want to pause and consider how huge this is. A residency program voluntarily relinquishing one-fifth of their curriculum, their entire didactic curriculum, back to the residents to drive their own education. This is revolutionary. Now, I will say, they didn't exactly just kind of turn them out wild and let them go. They, they set up some parameters, which is important to consider. 
first, and I apologize, I think the text is a little bit small on this slide, but this gives you a, a, kind of some outlines about what exactly the stipulations around the, uh, the I-3 program. So first, they said program directors must monitor resident participation. Second, they said there must be an evaluation component. Third, there must be faculty oversight. And finally, the activity must be monitored for effectiveness. So in the ensuing eight years, there's been an enormous amount of attention within the EM residency community about how I-3 is being used. Is it being used? There were certainly early adopters. So Brown University developed an entire learning server to manage these resident activities. Others kind of cautiously waited on the shores of I-3, waiting for others to report back. But the most important part of the innovation was the subsequent study and reporting on how I-3 was being used and how I-3 should be used. And I think we can learn a lot about how the incorporation of medical podcasting within their curricula, at least as far as the individualist activity, might be modeled by us. And this paper that I'm presenting was written by a subset of the, uh, a subset of the Council of Re uh, Residency Directors of the Best Practices Committee. They systematically reviewed published literature about I-3, and they, uh, they recommended some uh, kind of best practices. First, they said that I-3 should be used cautiously with novice learners. This makes a ton of sense. So uh, adult learning theory, we know, prioritizes self-directed learning. We identify our own gaps, and we target those. Um, However, early in training, our learners might not yet have the tools or the experiences to know what they don't know. Early on in training, it might make sense to make sure everyone's at a, a, a ground, a, a fr the same foundation of knowledge, and then let them get the experience to figure out what they need more and less experience, uh, education for. Second, the best practices recommendations uh, recommended that when designing or developing an implementation of I3, Residencies should first identify gaps in the current curriculum, or they should identify topics that may be best transitioned to the I3 format. So Chris and I aren't proposing that podcasting in and of itself is a panacea. There are plenty of educational topics that simply can't be adequately covered by podcasts. Reading an EKG, reviewing a chest X-ray, these are great examples of that. I, I will say, uh, the Curbsiders just launched a physical exam segment, which is awesome. So I, I appreciate those of us who are pushing the limits of what we can and can't cover. But the bottom line is that there are going to be limits. Um, so I think the question is we should think about these and how to best use these types of modalities depending on the educational objectives that we are seeking to cover. And finally, the Best Practices Committee went out there and said what we all were thinking, which is, the use of audio, video, and podcast alone constitutes passive learning and is not considered interactive. We get this. This makes a lot of sense. I remember what our trailblazing chiefs at Ohio State did. They incorporated, and how they incorporated medical podcasting, right? Not only was it used as a precursor to a social media-based session, but it was also paired with audience response questions. It was moderated by a discussion with the content creator. This layering of educational materials over the podcast is exactly what the creators of I3 had in mind when they uh, sought out to incorporate this type of media into their uh, curricula. And finally, I, what I think is even the best part about I3 is that the EM educator world responded by curating and organizing high quality material explicitly for the use by residents seeking to fulfill their I3 requirement. The, perhaps the most widely adopted single resource is the Alium Air series, so Alium, the Academic Life and Emergency Medicine put together their approved instructional resources because they watched their residents struggle to how to evaluate the quality of these online resources. The modules allow learners to individualize education while giving program directors some degree of oversight. And with a short evaluation component, each of these um, small, short modules satisfy all of the program requirements of I3. So, at this point in our talk, we've demonstrated why we think podcasts are a powerful tool that can augment traditional medical education. Though try as we might, podcasts will never replace a traditional medical curricula. Before we send you off to review the vast podcasting resources available within your specialty, we should discuss a few very important barriers and threats to this modality of education. The first major barrier that many people hear almost certainly have with unleashing their learners on this untested library of internet-based uh, educational content is quality. And that, again, we, we agree. We are competing with time-honored traditions of 
Harrison and Netter and up to date. I get it. So for what it's worth, we, we agree. In a national survey of EM residents, Chris mentioned this paper earlier, nearly half of the respondents reported that they never or rarely evaluate the quality of evidence or review the references. In my experience, that number is probably much higher. The logos that you see listed on this slide are the members of the IM Pod Squad Research Collaboration. So you see uh, Curbsiders and Core IM, as well as a few others. All of these episodes uh, offer, or all of these podcasts within certain episodes offer CME, which is uh, necessitates some degree of review. And uh, when you see CME, there there is at least a layer of critical appraisal that has got, that has uh, gone into that. It's one way to help listeners feel more comfortable with the information they're receiving. But the bottom line here is that we teach critical appraisal of medical literature early in medical education. Med school first year, often we start talking about sensitivity and specificity. At some point, we need to recognize that our learners and our students are using these resources, and we need to impart upon them the skills that are, that are necessary to actively evaluate this content instead of passively listening. There are validated tools available, and I'm happy to share those um, with anybody who is interested. The second important barrier to consider is what we know and what we don't know about the end users of our podcast. So we know that a lot of people listen to us, uh, that we know that a lot of people listen to us, and it's amazing. It's it, truly, it's, it's uh, heartwarming that we have the opportunity to educate an enormous uh, audience. But we also need to pause and consider that our listeners are a self-selecting group. What does that tell us about the people who aren't listening? What does listening to podcasts for education tell us about our learners? And what does abstaining from listening to podcasts for education tell us about those learners? The bottom line here is we don't know. Um, until then, uh, until we do know more about the learners who are selecting and learners who are selecting uh, against listening to podcasts, pan inclusion of podcasting broadly probably misses subtle but important differences in learners that make sense and we should pay attention to. Another related question is about differences within the podcasts themselves. So we know that there are very different styles of podcasts. Chris mentioned all different formats and different um, uh, strategies. Um, what are best practices in podcasts? Well, that's another active area of unknown, right? How many dad jokes are too many before you start losing credibility? I, I have a vested interest in the answer to that question. But the bottom line is that these are important questions, and as podcasting becomes more and more entrenched in our curricula, they raise important research, research agenda um, for best practices in the use of uh, podcasting and what it's telling us about our learners. And finally, I would be remiss, remiss if I don't mention sustainability. So right now, the majority of us who are making podcasts are doing it on nights and weekends. And let's be honest, there's a lot of medical education medical teaching is done on a volunteer basis, and most of us have a tacit acceptance of that, and we derive satisfaction from the privilege of guiding new waves of physicians. But because most podcasting groups exist within the interstitium of academia, meaning we're not formally associated with any particular academic institution, but we're kind of between them, there is no automatic support for this time. So we find support. Some groups will offer to sponsor, some outside groups will offer to sponsor content in exchange for airtime. In accepting these arrangements, podcast creators need to carefully weigh the financial uh, recognition of our work with the possible threat to credibility. Many well-recognized podcasts will admit they have pharmaceutical companies offer to sponsor episodes. How would you feel if the next episode of your favorite podcast was brought to you by Dexcom or Gilead or Regeneron, what we would give for a little bit of paid time to do this work. The flip side to that argument is that we also realize that in accepting effort from our institutions, sometimes that means relinquishing control and relinquishing ownership or the appearance of control and ownership. And for many of us, that's a price that we're not willing to pay. So I, I raise these uh, points not to solve them, but just to mention that sustainability is a real issue and needs to be addressed as we move forward. So, at this point, we've demonstrated how podcasting innovations by digital scholarship content creators provides opportunities to augment traditional curricula. I've given you some 
concerns and threats. But what do we want you to do now? So, step one, we need to rethink the routine lecture. I realize the irony in saying this delivered in a grand rounds lecture, but I use, those phrase, I use that phrase purposely, uh, meaning purposefully, uh, we need to think the routine lecture. Because we can't and we shouldn't make everything a team-based learning activity. And there's only so many think pair shares that an adult learner can stomach. The fact is, today is, it is October of 2020. We are amidst a global pandemic that has forced our learners out of our classrooms and out of our lecture halls, and that we have to make necessary adaptations to our curricula. And these adaptations have shown us that simply taking a lecture and slapping it into Zoom is a missed opportunity. And I, I, I am not suggesting here that there is not incredible innovation happening, because there is, and I'm not suggesting that our teachers here and across the globe are not working tirelessly to accommodate these new digital, uh, digital educational environments. But what I'm suggesting is that we can't continue to try to fit a square peg into a round hole. The growth of podcasting and other educational in uh, initiatives within the digital space demonstrates that our learners have the ability and the desire to access information in times and places that lectures simply cannot accommodate. So as our teachers continue to revamp curricula, as they have done for the thousand years of COVID and all the years before COVID, we need to ensure that if we're using lectures, if we are using lectures to deliver content to our learners, that we are doing it for a reason. We are reaching for the lecture because that is the best modality to get our, our learners from point A to point B and not because that is what always has been done. So, how do you start thinking about ways to incorporate podcasting into and other foam curricula into our, our educational criteria? I'm going to present you a, form, a, a paradigm that was published in a recent paper by our colleagues and friends, fellow podcasters, Dr. Robbie uh, Geha and Dr. Reza Manesh. They published with their colleague, Dr. Dan Minter, and of course, the great Dr. Gupri Dhaliwal. Um, in this paper, they argued that COVID-19 has catalyzed a digital education revolution, and as such, clinici clinician educators need to consider the stereotyped roles that we have always inhabited and how they can be adapted using new digital tools. So the first role is the educator, educator as a creator. So teachers have always been teaching has always been a creative endeavor. And these authors argue that social media is now the new global classroom. Specifically, there are features of medical Twitter, Twitter such as the tutorial, that allow this just-in-time pithy education beamed right to our phones where we're at, when we need it. Uh, this specific example showcases Dr. Avi Cooper, one of our own pulmonologists, uh, and unanimously considered one of the top medical tutorialists. Yes, I did just call him a tutorialist. I'm, I'm copywriting that one. Second is the role of the moderator, and I don't mean like Chris Wallace, but you try entering moderator in Google Images right now and see what kind of responses you get. Here I want you to think about the role of the chief resident at Morning Report. The role of the moderator here is navigating learners through clinical, through clinical cases um, while uh, looking for teachable moments. These, these authors uh, have taken that idea and made it global with their virtual morning report. This is, they now do a worldwide morning report hosted on Zoom featuring a master clinician and diagnosticians who lead an interactive case-based session. If you haven't done one of these, I would highly, highly recommend it. It is amazing and it breaks down the walls of our institutional, uh, our institutional barriers it is a fantastic opportunity to collaborate and see how other people across the globe are thinking. And finally, there is the role of the curator. Clinical teachers have always served as the intermediaries between learners and literature. We all have that person, that teacher that we can call on to remember that one cardiology trial with the acronym that you can't remember. This is exactly what are asking our audience, you guys right now to think about with, our, with, with your learners who are engaging in the medical podcasting world. So just like uh, these authors, we think that becoming familiar with the canon of medical podcasts that your students are listening to will not only help steer them towards great resources, but will also allow facile incorporation into your current teaching. 
Just like anything else, as you get to know the body of work, you realize that it's smaller than it initially seems, and hopefully you'll find material that suits your teaching well. So, returning to our title, Medical Podcasting, Fleeting Fad or Durable Innovation? We really hope at this point we have shown you and explained the merits of podcasting and unveiled some of the great innovations that we're having in the medical education space. We hope that we have shown that there are definitely important barriers to broad implementation and incorporation into medical curricula. However, we have multiple opportunities now to learn about our learners and their learning. We hope that we have empowered you, the frontline clinician educators, with the tools you need to become something like a podcast curator. So, the difference between medical podcasting emerging as durable innovation or disappearing as a fleeting fad depends on you. It depends on your adoption. It depends on your thoughtful criticism and your willingness to try new strategies. For us teachers, the classroom is our lab. So go experiment.